The Sinister Painting, written by Grayless Pina, performed by Barry Bowman. The taxi drove off, leaving Funk on the Hoddesdon lawn, surrounded by valises. Funk was thinking it more than merely odd that Barclay, for whose coaching he'd come prepared to spend a month, had not met him as planned. He tried the screen door. It was hooked inside. Hello in there. There was no response. The Hoddesdon farm lay drenched in a torpid lethargy for which it was obvious more than the July heat must be responsible. Within the house, no one stirred. On the surrounding fields, no one was abroad. Even the usual sounds of the farm animals were hushed. Funk was unpleasantly affected. Surely the entire household had not gone to meet his train and somehow missed it. He carried his traps to the stoop, crossed the yard to the barnyard, and hallowed again. Hello! He knew of old where Barclay's studio was, so he set off down the path toward the grateful shade of the woods. The gray stone walls of the old building soon glinted through the tree trunks in heavy foliage. A strong conviction possessed Funk that Barclay was not within. In fact, he found the studio door padlocked. He noted that the west window was rudely boarded up. He walked around the studio to the north. Here the trees had been cut down, and the studio wall was entirely of glass. He peered in with deepening curiosity, but apart from the usual litter of easels, painting paraphernalia and accessories, canvases in serried rows against the walls, his attention was almost immediately drawn to a painting propped against the south wall where the full light from the opposite windows poured in revealingly. Hmm, run go, that never is Barclay's work, and he'd never let a student perpetrate such a monstrosity of hue and crude color. He pressed his face to the glass, cupping it against the outside light. That old man, it may be crudely done, but he's also absolutely horrible. His hands, ugh, they're dead hands, bloodless, waxen, ugh. Something about the way he's sitting there, drooping as if he hadn't the strength of himself to sit erect and was being held by something, something without that you can't see. Well, I don't like that thing. It's, it's ugly. There's... There's something wrong with it. He said this last with conviction, and as he exclaimed, became aware of another gaze fixed upon himself. He snapped upright and wheeled quickly, waiting patiently for him to finish his examination of the studio's interior, stood a man in patched, stained blue overalls. Well? Uh, Mr. Barclay's at the house, sir. You're Mr. Funk? I'm, um, I'm Malkaihi, Hoddiston's hired man. Uh, all right. I'm coming. How did Mr. Barclay come to miss my train? Well, we was all down to the police station, sir. Police station? What, what, what's been going on here? Uh, I found Mr. Oki uh, dead in the studio this morning, sir. What? Oh, there's something wrong in there, sir. I, I saw the blood on the, on the old devil's beard. Oh, snap out of it, Mulcahy. Are you referring to that picture? I am not, sir. Blood on the old man's beard? It's ridiculous. I saw none. Oh, blood it was, sir. And the poor young man's was all drained out of him, sir. Ha! <laughs> this sounds intriguing. Blood on the old man's beard? I'm dripping from his dead finger, sir. And not one drop left in the corpse, sir. Blood all over the damned old devil's whiskers and on his dead fingers, sir. Oh, merry mother. Who did that painting? A man by the name of Silva, sir. He's after being a cabinet maker, but he got to thinking he could paint, so... He made that beauty back there. Devil fly away with him. He sure can paint. Oh, he's mixing something with his paint that only the devils from the, the pit can give him. Sir, the night before the poor lad was murdered, there was a fine canvas of Mr. Barclay's cut into ribbons, and Mr. Oakey's prize picture the same. What might that mean, along with the poor lad's being killed the next night? And, and Silva only, only getting honorable mention last week where he was looking for first prize. Oh, looks as if Silva had a motive. Life was stirring normally about the farm now, as if a ban of enchanted silence had been lifted. Funk could see Barclay's bulky body leaning over the valises on the front stoop. He hailed his friend, and then asked Mulcahy hastily, What do the police say? Any one of us might have done it, sir. But the studio was locked from the inside, and there's no motive. 
and they can't figure where the poor lad's blood went, sir. Back of the simple words pushed a dark significance of terrible things. Looks as if there were more here than appears on the surface. Oh, right ye are, sir. From now on, Tom Mulcahy wears a blessed medal next to his hide, day and night. Funk met Barclay's welcoming hand with a heartening grip. Uh, sorry to have missed you, Funk, but this ghastly tragedy has dislocated all plans. I, I was fond of the boy. He had a gift, had Eddie. Uh, I, was, I was looking forward to what he would do with color in not far future, and uh, now... Where's my room, Barclay? Funk gathered up his bags and followed the other painter up the front steps. Both men lighted cigarettes in silence. Barclay stared abstractedly from the window, while Funk unpacked rapidly, puffing clouds of smoke about himself as he tossed shirts, underwear, ties into the open bureau drawers. I want to know how Silva's paintings got into your studio. So you're taking that attitude? Uh, well, anybody but a crass, materialistic jackass would. No, oh, I didn't know you went in for that sort of thing. Well, I've no time for anything but painting. Just making a living takes most of my time these days, Funk. Well, very little suffices for me. I'm too fascinated with studying the truths underlying the illusions of material existence. Not that I've gotten very far, but uh, what I know, I know. Uh, then perhaps you can say what's unnatural about poor Harry's death. I know there's something wrong about it. Something wrong? Yes, there's something wrong and uncanny about the lad's death. As to its being unnatural, well, there are many strange and little-known laws operating along lines so new to us. Uh, I believe the poor chap's death is due to an extremely interesting example of the transference of an evil will to power. Well, I didn't tell the police what I felt lay behind this tragedy. I have no hankering to live in an insane asylum. Now I have faint hope that you may be able to appreciate the strangeness of my experience. Listen, Manuel Silva settled here a few years ago, and he's been doing well as a cabinet maker. Recently he learned that I got from three hundred dollars up for a canvas, and he thought this was an easy way to get rich. <laughs> but I refused to teach him. Well, you know I never take any but advanced students of decided promise. My refusal roused Silva's furious resentment. I've instituted an annual art exhibit in town. Silva entered three canvases to force my hand. They were rather terrible. One was a, a blacksmith, dark, sullen, sinister. He was hammering viciously at what appeared to be a battered crucifix. Another was a, a farmer slaughtering a wretched hog that somehow looked like a naked man. The butcher's face wore a too realistic grin of sadistic enjoyment as he wielded his bloody knife. Uh, the third, well, the third was the painting you've just seen in my studio. Harry's entry took first prize. This, this was inevitable. I felt inclined to encourage a couple of young local artists, so I gave them honorable mention, and not to slight Silver's pride, I included him. The night before the canvases were removed, Harry and I were in the gallery, and he pointed out that someone had deliberately cut the honorable mention ribbon and Silva's canvas so that it hung in dangling strips. Odd that, eh? Oh, you're opening vistas. You're absolutely interesting. Well, I criticized Silva's paintings, observing that Harry was right when he said it gave him the jitters, but that in just that degree it possessed a touch of wild genius. Harry pronounced it ghastly, to paint a hunched-up old man as dead as a doornail, his hands frightful, decomposing, yet sitting up there. Ugh! Silver's colors were crude, his drawing distorted. Just how it would be difficult to say, but wrong, you understand, just wrong. I said I dared not encourage Silver because of a very strange quality in his work, that that's something wrong. And then we both nearly jumped out of our skins, for in the dusk behind us someone broke into an ugly chuckle, and we turned to see a dark figure slouching out. It was Silver, and I realized that he'd heard me pronounce him an evil genius. Harry made light of my compunctions, but I was, I was disturbed. We confronted the old man in the painting once more. As twilight gained the room, a murky dusk seemed creeping into the very canvas. Its shadows deepened, 
the old man merged into his dark background, all but his pallid face, his grayish beard, the waxen fingers dropping over his angular knees. It was wrong, entirely wrong. And then all at once Harry twitched my sleeve and exclaimed, Let's get out of here. And we turned and plunged into the night, stricken by some subtle panic so obsessing that it was not until we were back at the Hoddesdon farm that we realized how, <laughs> how foolish and unreasonable had been our flight. Funk lighted another cigarette. We went sketching next day, and, and Hoddesdon brought our canvases back to the studio. That night he told me that Silva had sent me one of his for a gift. So Harry and I went down to see which one. We lighted candles, and really we got a nasty shock. The flickering, inadequate candlelight made that old man appear more than ever an entity with a horrid existence, independent of his painted presentment. Oh, my God! Harry said, my God, in, in a kind of comic dismay. And I knew instinctively that Silver was up to no good. He, he bore me malice. His very gift seemed to convey dire menace. In the pale candlelight, the old man's beard appeared to rustle stiffly, as if his lips were parting under his bushy shelter. Of course I could not see anything, but I, I felt that I was seeing a, a pale dead tongue flick moisture over dry dead lips. <laughs> Oh, that must have been an odd sensation. You make it very clear. Yes? Well, there's more of it, Funk. Oki and I went over our canvases to check on their return in good condition. We were satisfied. Just remember this point, will you? We padlocked the studio door and went off to bed. When we went in next morning, the padlock was undisturbed and all the windows locked on the inside. But one of my best canvases had been slit into ribbons, and Harry's, which had taken first prize, was completely demolished, even the, th the frame. That last act of vandalism made me feel bad. I'd been sure the boy could cash in on his work, and he needed the money. He took it like a Spartan, but he told me he was going to sleep in the studio that night, for he felt sure that Silva had done the damage. And I agreed, although I I couldn't figure out how Silver could have gotten inside. So last night I left the boy there. He said he was going to hang something over the old man's gosh-awful face. I offered to stay with him, but he, he wouldn't have it. This morning, this morning, Malkai told me. Uh, it was ghastly funk. Malkai was howling blood at every jump he took. Blood, he yelled, on the old man's beard. Hmm. How about the coroner? Harry had been dead for hours, finger marks on his throat, every drop of blood drained from his body. Mulcahy had seen him through the north windows. I had to break the west window to get in. The coroner said at first he'd had a fit, but finally decided he'd been killed by a person unknown. About the blood? Uh, Mulcahy was right about it, Funk. I saw it, too. It's not there now. Yeah, that's another strange thing. When I rushed over, I found poor Harry sprawling on the floor, his body all twisted in a grotesque, gruesome position, and so terribly white. As I threw myself on the floor beside him, something struck upon my inner ear. It, it was a sound, but such a sound. Even as I heard it, I knew I was hearing what could not be apprehended physically. I sprang to my feet and confronted Silver's hideous canvas. God, it was horrible! Oh, the painted old man sat there motionless, but it was a sinister restraint, Funk. I stared, stricken by a horror that affected me with nausea, for I saw then that someone had smeared that ancient's deadly pallor with crimson that crawled down the painted grey beard. The dead hands that hung over the angular knees were dripping ev every pallid fingertip with blood. Blood, Funk! How do you know it was blood? I... I touched it. And then? A ghastly thing came to pass. I did not see it. I felt rather than saw. I became aware with that inner sense of the movement of one of the old man's painted arms. It lifted with the jerking unevenness of, of an automaton and passed across the stained grey beard. I say it moved. I felt it move. Yet at the same time I was aware that it was only painted, hence incapable of movement. It was as something else behind it that actually moved. I, 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 I find it almost impossible to clarify my intuitions, other than to say that while the painted figure did not stir, I, 
I was yet inwardly aware that it lifted one arm and wiped away the crimson from its beard. Then it reached out on either side to drag off that horrible drip from its waxen fingertips against the painted glass that reddened under them. Oh, God! It was more than horrible, because although the figure did not show movement to my straining eyes, yet I saw the crimson lifeblood of poor Harry disappearing from the canvas as those movements, which I felt rather than saw, took place. <sighs> of course, this explanation is inadequate. Funk pushed the consumed tip of his cigarette to the fresh one he was holding between his thin lips. A cloud of smoke enveloped him. Not adequate, my dear fellow. On the contrary, it is very enlightening. So clear that I believe we may yet punish the murderer of that poor lad. Oh, I'd give a year of my life to accomplish that. Well, I hardly think so much will be required, but you may have to sacrifice one or two of your canvases. We'd better get the rest of Oki's work over here and Silva must learn that you are taking steps to protect Harry's work and your own. He must be informed that tomorrow night you yourself will sleep in the studio. That will bring him. Uh, you agree that it's Silva? I've no doubt about it, but not in propria persona. He's projecting his astral body through that hideous old man, and he's already made a grave error. What do you mean? He's permitted himself to savor human blood, Hence he cannot be permitted to continue. He's dangerous now. He will be yet more so, unless checked. I propose to do this in the only permanent way possible. We have no proof of his presence in the studio, Funk. Who would believe the intangible evidence of my experience? No one ordinarily. But I believe. And there's another person who will not only believe, but will furnish me with the means of putting a stop to Silver's murderous proclivities, without disturbing the authorities unduly. Wouldn't it be wise to return that picture to Silva, or cut it to bits and burn it? Later. You see, Silva has somehow learned how to transfer his will for evil to that creature of his own making. It's through the same creation that we must reach him and stop his criminal career before it's too late. Oh, you speak as if you knew what you were talking about, Funk. I can't just understand you, but I feel that you're, you're somehow right. What do you wish done? Get Melkaye or Hoddiston to clear out all Oki's canvases. Leave only a couple of your own that you don't particularly care about so as not to stir Silva's suspicions overly. He'll imagine you're exhibiting. Then have Hoddiston step in and tell Silva what happened to the canvases in the studio and ask him to have his moved out of harm's way. That will appear a kindly impulse on your part, and he will reply that he'll send for his canvases in a couple of days. He'll figure on polishing you off by then. Uh, agreeable thought, that. Now, you're going to lend me your roadster. I'll be back tomorrow afternoon at the latest. Be sure Sylvie is given to understand that tomorrow night you'll be sleeping in the studio. Under no circumstances, however, venture in there tonight. Tonight, Silva, or whatever wakens in the studio under the stimulus of his evil purpose, may have free play. But tomorrow night, ah, tomorrow night, I shall be there, not you. Oh, I won't permit your getting into a nasty situation, Funk. This, 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 this isn't your affair. After all, Harry was my protégé. It's up to me. Aha! <laughs> Are you prepared to give effective battle to a painted demon, Barclay? Can you, through that painted thing, silence forever the intangible, distant malefactor? You can do such things? I shall know how to, before I return tomorrow afternoon. Uh, but how? I'm going to someone who knows. I shall demand the secret. She will yield it, I'm certain. I'm going to see Gwen Caradorn. Where have I heard that name? Possibly in connection with her published brochures. Her reality of the abstract is fairly well known. It's discussed everywhere. Uh, quite likely. I seem to remember it vaguely. Now, how about your car? It was dusk when Funk returned on the following day. The seriousness and abstraction that wove a cloak about him struck Barclay's curious inquiries into silence. A certain high air about the younger artist forbade imperiously any break upon that lofty mood. Funk's first query was, had Silva been duly informed of the occupation of the studio that night? Oh, he knows. He told Hoddiston that he would call for his unappreciated masterpiece in a couple of days. The words were significantly emphasized. I'd rather fancied he'd say that. He knows you'll be there tonight. Uh, Hoddiston told him if there were any further trouble, uh, I'd sleep there tonight on to protect his painting. Excellent. And was there any? 
Yes. Last night the two canvases I'd left were demolished. Good. He'll be expecting you to sleep there tonight. Let's have supper, and then I'll run into town and fetch Miss Caradon. She insists upon coming out. The time was too brief to prepare me to handle the situation single-handed. Well, that's extraordinarily kind of her, Funk, but if she's to be at the studio tonight, why, why, why not I? She would have handled it alone, only that uh, she... Sorry, I can't be more explicit, but she bans discussion of herself unless she decides to come out into the open, which she rarely does. She's... Well, wait until you meet her, if she permits it. You, you'll understand then. But believe me, she is worthy the highest respect and admiration a human being could expect. Funk did not have to drive to town. Between dusk and dark, a shining dark blue car with a special delivery body slipped into the driveway. From the limousine-like front, two uniformed men alighted and walked to the rear of the car. There were wide doors there, which they proceeded to open. They withdrew with the utmost care a strange anachronism, a blue and black and gold decorated sedan chair, small and delicate. They placed themselves between the shafts and started toward the farmhouse. Funk exclaimed and sprang down the steps to meet the odd equipage. He bent over what was obviously an extended hand, white in the dusk. Barclay, staring, saw the young artist touch his lips to those extended fingers. A child's high, shrilly, sweet voice gave an order, and the chair-bearers carried the sedan-chair toward the barnyard. Funk followed, calling back as he went. See you tomorrow morning, Barclay. With that, he disappeared after the chair into the soft darkness beyond the barnyard. Barclay felt that he could not sleep. He was intensely irritated that Gwen Caradorn should have sent a child to take her place in what he felt must be a post of danger. He went down to the shining automobile and walked around it with curiosity. The rear doors had been closed, and nothing marked it as out of the ordinary, save, perhaps, the expensive type of shock absorbers for a delivery body, and, of course, what looked very like a periscope set in the top as much out of place as was a modern child in a sedan chair. He sat at his window, fell asleep there in his chair, and did not waken until Mrs. Hoddiston tapped at his door, calling that Mr. Funk and the little girl had returned. She volunteered that the little girl was a perfect little French doll. Barclay took the stairs, three at a stride. In the hall, Funk sat on a hassock, which brought his face slightly below the level of the small, oval countenance of the child, who sat sedately on the half-chair. Barclay noted with an artist's appreciation the bloom on her dazzling cheeks, the straight nose, the richly scarlet mobile lips. He approved the curling black lashes, finely penciled arching eyebrows, sleek black bobbed hair her creamy silk dress, rather long than worn by most children of her age, apparently about six, was smocked in a knowing fashion with bright colors. Her feet were inappropriately encased in high-heeled French slippers. All this the artist in Barclay captured at a glance, just as he took in the beauty of the slender, tiny hands of the taper fingers and the eloquence of every gesture. A strange and unusual child, this. His leaping footsteps brought upon him a lifting of fringed eyelids, and what he felt shrinkingly was a glance of indifference. He stopped short at the foot of the staircase, abashed at this disdainful glance. He knew all at once why this child's frock was longer than customary, why her tiny feet wore adult-style footgear, why sophistication animated those taper fingers. The cobalt-blue eyes that regarded him from the child's elfin face were the eyes of a grown woman. They were the informed eyes of one who had passed through the fires of varied experiences, the eyes of one who had gazed unafraid upon unveiled mysteries. The child was not a child, but was an exquisite midget, a creature set apart from the entire world by her miniature proportions. Funk sprang up, caught the other man's hand, and drew him down to the hassock, himself sinking upon the floor so that both men's faces were below the level of the midgets. Barclay! Miss Caradorn permits me to present you. Uh, Honoured, Miss Caradorn. Uh... Barclay sat, still confused under the keen gaze of those faintly derisive blue eyes. He understood it after a minute. She was touched with amusement at his discomfiture. An elfish smile twitched at one corner of her scarlet lips, and she actually turned away those two shrewd eyes as if to spare Barclay's feelings. 
a kindly gesture which did not serve to tranquilize him, for there was just a touch of condescension in her half-smile. Mr. Funk has been showing me these canvases from your studio. I would very much like that snow scene. It is charming. If you will tell me the price. I, I would feel honored if you would accept it as a, a proof of my gratitude for your having come here. You are anxious to learn the outcome of last night's plans? Suspended in the bosom of her frock by a slender platinum chain was a platinum whistle which she put to her lips and sounded. At once the bearers of the sedan chair came up the steps and into the hall, holding the chair close to their mistress. Like some bright bird, so airy and graceful was her lithe movement, she seemed to fly from her chair into the sedan's shelter. She waved one tiny hand. The bearers took their light burden outside, slid it into place in the rear of the waiting automobile. They mounted into the front, and the car slipped noiselessly away down the road, bespeaking the many-cylindered motor by its very silence and power. Ah, so that strange little thing is your wonderful Gwen Caradorn. Why didn't you warn me? Funk lighted the cigarette hastily and began surrounding himself with smoke. Why didn't I? Because she won't be talked about. She's proud and sensitive. She considers her miniature body the ultimate of human perfection and won't permit its comparison with what she considers our gross bodies. And she's abnormally proud of her brain. She has reason to be. I, I think it's the most highly developed I've ever known. As an oculist, she's the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter. You're anxious to know about last night. She's forbidden me to divulge details, but I may tell you briefly that Silva will never again repeat his evil act. He was there, then, last night? Not in propria persona, but his familiar was already locked in with us when I bolted the door behind Gwen and myself. What, what, what do you mean? Let's go down to the studio. It's easier to understand when you've seen things with your own eyes. The telephone rang. Mrs. Huddleston ran out of the kitchen and answered it. An expression of horror settled on her placid face. Manuel Silva's been found dead with a knife wound in his throat. Funk beckoned Barclay silently, and the two hurried across the barnyard and into the woods. With the key Barclay had loaned him, Funk unlocked the padlock. He pushed the studio door open. Words seemed superfluous. Spread on the floor lay a painted canvas figure, pinned down by a knife through its throat. The edges of the canvas were sharply defined, as if just cut out of the painting leaning against the south wall, with a neatly trimmed vacancy in its center. Barclay stared, closed his eyes convulsively, and then stared again. I couldn't have done it alone. She furnished the power. She'd have done it herself, but she's too... Uh, I mean, he... he was too tall. Barclay stared motionless. He was absorbing the details of a bizarre thing, which confirmed him in his hasty resolution to burn Silva's painting without delay. The empty space in the painting distinctly outlined a drooping, seated figure. The painted canvas shape lying on the floor, pinned down by the knife through its pallid painted throat, could have filled that vacancy twice over. It was a full-length, standing figure. Thanks for listening. The story you've just heard in this channel are fan-funded. Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com today to become a patron and help us bring radio theater back from the dead. Just click support us, choose an amount you're comfortable with, and become a part of our family today. Just $2 per month gets you immediate access to our patrons area. There, you'll find advanced new releases, our incredible archive of over 300 hours of productions, plus never-before-heard bonus material. Best of all, it's totally ad-free and in HD MP3 format. You get insider updates from our production team, the secret stash of streaming downloadable HD indie films, and you get to experience our patrons only one-on-one -on -one live events, putting you up close and personal with your favorite performers, unscripted and unrehearsed. All of this and more is yours today. And all you have to do is choose your level of support. Go to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com now and join us as we turn off the lights and turn on the dark.